All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad everybody can join us. It seems like we're going to have a big crowd this morning. Oh, I'm sorry, this afternoon. I'm getting my times mixed up. Um, but I just want to say welcome to everyone. My name is Dr. Johnny Pula, and I'm the Associate Director of Student Success Services with ACES, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Um, I hope everyone's doing fine and well and safe. Um, I know that most of you or all of you are probably watching from your home safely and um, yeah, that's probably gonna be our new normal, um, but I'm glad everybody can make it. I know I'm glad that we have technology and opportunities like this to still get together and have these moments where um, we can share important information like this. And I know ACES is um, supporting everyone and for, our students out there, I want to I want to say that um, you know we're all thinking about you, and I know these are trying times for our students, and you still have classes, most of you. So um, just hang in there. Um, I know it's going to be tough for a few few more weeks, maybe, but um, just know that we're all thinking of you, and um, we are still supporting you. Um, and this is one of the ways that we're doing that. So I'm so glad that Intel is. Um, wanted to provide these uh, webinars for us. So if you don't know, we're going to have four webinars this year. Um, this is our very first one. And on that note, I want to say that um, this is my first time to actually host one. So if if there's any, um, <laughs> if something's not quite right, um, I'll do better next time. Um, but so just bear with us. Um, I'd also want to say that if you have like, any issues, um, technical issues, viewing or sound, um, if you want to put that in the chat, we will address those in the chat um, throughout the webinar. So again, I'm thankful for everyone to come. Um, this first webinar, the topic is going to be AI. So we're going to explore the world of AI. Um, we're going to understand like what it's used for and why. And we have an awesome speaker with us today for our very first one. Um, and it's my pleasure. I want to introduce her first before I go into some house um, roles for us. But I want to introduce our facilitator. This is Megana Rao. Megana Rao is, if you want to wave, Megana, there she is. So, Ms. Rao is a technical ma marketing engineer at Intel, and she serves as a Developer Evangelist for Intel Family of Products and Solutions. In her current role as an AI Evangelist, she works closely with universities and developers in evangelizing Intel's AI portfolio and solutions, helping them understand machine learning and deep learning concepts, building models and POCs using Intel's optimized frameworks and libraries like CAFE, TensorFlow, and Intel Distribution of Python. She also has worked on the Intel RealSense technology and Windows 8 application development for scalable form factors. She has a bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering and a master's degree in engineering and technology management with past experiences in embedded software development, Windows app development, and UX design methodologies. So we, like I said, we have a great um, presenter here with us today and we're fortunate for that. Um, before I let Ms. Rao um, continue, I want to share some housekeeping rules before we begin. So our webinar is scheduled for an hour, so it's going to be a little time constraint, but if we go over, that's totally fine. Um, we're a little bit flexible there. But in order to um, make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible, um, we are going to disable the webcam for everyone. So as as much as we'd like to see everybody's faces, we're going to disable that just so um, we don't disrupt um, the presentation. And so we will um, be disabling the webcam soon as we begin. Also, to the um, everybody will be on mute for the duration of the webinar, but there will be questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you like, in the chat box, um, the chat icon right there. If you want to, um, actually, we welcome you to put your questions in the chat box there, and then we'll address those at the end of the webinar. So it's the little um, dialogue box icon at the very top right. 
actually third to the right, if you want to do the chat there, you're welcome to put in your questions and we'll address them at the end. Um, also, too, I want to make sure that um, at the end of the webinar, we have some important information and some updates for you guys. So I hope you continue to stay on um, throughout the duration. Um, and again, if there's any questions or if you um, have any comments, go ahead and put those in the chat box. And again, we'll address those at the end. So I want to make sure that everybody is on board and good to go. And if there's nothing else, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, uh, Ms. Rao. Thank you so much, Johnny, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank AISCS for having me on this very first webinar. This is going to be a very basic introduction to artificial intelligence. This will introduce some of the core concepts of artificial intelligence like machine learning and deep learning. And in subsequent web webinars that Intel and AISES will together be hosting, you will see more detailed topics. So with that, let's take a look at what today's agenda looks like. The first is just a very brief introduction of artificial intelligence. I'll cover a brief history of AI and what the reasons are for current day momentum. And I'll share uh, in brief what Intel is doing in the space of AI, what the overall artificial intelligence journey for a developer looks like with introductions to both machine learning and deep learning, and then come to some of the challenges that we have in solving problems through AI and provide you with some of the community support. And at that point, we will take Q&A. So let's take a look at what artificial intelligence actually is. So you're looking at this diagram on the left here, which has three different circles. So AI is the broad umbrella where we are actually helping machines learn how to emulate the human brain. Within that is the second circle, which is machine learning which includes most of the statistical methodologies within artificial intelligence. And inside that you have deep learning, which essentially is about building what we call neural networks that along with the amount of data that we feed in, it will learn on its own and be able to make predictions. So artificial intelligence basically has two steps. The first one is training a model where we take existing data for any problem that you want to solve and we train a model to bring about an accurate enough prediction. So once we do that, we take this application and deploy it in the field. And at that point, we feed real time data to it. And the hope is that the model will provide us with the same or similar kind of accuracy that was available during training. So essentially, those are the two components for artificial intelligence models. Now let's take a look at some of the, the history. So AI is actually not new at all. It has existed for quite a while. Uh, to be honest, it began sometime in the 1950s when Alan Turing created the first perceptron model that exhibited intelligent behavior. But since then, we have had certain cycles where the momentum kind of slipped off. And um, in some cases, that was because some of the advisory committees thought it was not uh, worth the investment. Um, in some cases, it was proven that AI was really not mature enough to solve complicated problems. So the momentum kind of slowed down and picked up again. But in the last decade or two, we have actually seen a significant amount of research happening in the space of both machine learning and deep learning, and that has kicked the momentum off. There are certain reasons to why AI is holding the momentum today and it'll probably even pick up even more going into the future. So I would like to draw your attention to the column here on the left. One of the reasons why artificial intelligence is so prevalent today is because of the access to data that we have. So let's just run down this list and see how much data on an average are generated by each of these segments. So an average internet user generates approximately 25 gigabytes of data. Um, a smart car, car, on the other hand, about 50 GB per day compared to 25 GB per month for an average internet user. 
And if you go down that list, the amount of data that is generated, depending on the industry that we are looking at, is exponentially higher. So with the access to this kind of data, what exactly can we do? Let's take a look at this curve here. There are multiple um, steps here. The first one is called descriptive analytics that actually tells you what happened in hindsight. In the next circle here, we have diagnostic analysis where you can actually tell why something happened. But both descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics are called operational analytics and they by themselves are not really sufficient. You want to be able to use the data to figure out how to predict future outcomes. And that is where predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, and cognitive analytics comes into the picture. The second step, the second reason why AI is so prolific today is because also of its acceptance across all of these industries that you are looking at. These are industries that also have very clear use cases. They have a high investment in the area and also a high return on investment. So if you just look at some of the examples like Alexa and Siri that we use um, on a more common basis, even through our phones some, these days, you can understand uh, the kind of usages that artificial intelligence can actually provide solutions to. And again, there are multiple examples as I have listed here that span across multiple domains. The third aspect to why AI has gained momentum is the access to computational hardware. So in the box here on the left, you see endpoint devices. Essentially, these are very low power devices like personal computers, um, cameras, and drones that you deploy on the field. In the middle, you have the edge category where you have small distributed clusters. Maybe an industry would want to deploy a small cluster or it could be an MRI machine or a smart car and things like those. On the very far right, you have the data center, which we call the hyperscale systems, which is like AWS and the Google compute systems and things like that, data centers, essentially. So now let's take a look at in the space. So we talked about the access to computational hardware, right? And another reason is also that a lot of software these days is becoming open source. That is another reason as well. And Intel contributes very heavily in both the space of hardware and software, and we have community resources as well. So if you look at this arrow, the first one is CPU. <laughs> CPUs are these days used for both training as well as deep learning inference. So you remember those two diagrams that I showed together with the one diagram, right? Training and inference. In addition to the raw compute power, they also have accelerators. So if you have specific high performance computing workloads or any kind of media uh, capability, you can use GPUs. And if you are using vision capabilities, then you can use accelerators like Movidius and um, you have additional products as well across the entire pipeline. And these are augmented by the software stack. Even in software, there are different levels. The first is the application developers that actually are developing uh, front-end applications when you deploy on the field. This set of people actually need software development toolkits that provide ready-to-use APIs. And Intel has a spectrum of toolkits that are available there. If you're looking at a data scientist that generate AI algorithms, for them, you need an additional layer of optimizations in terms of optimizations to Python, in terms of optimizations to the different frameworks that exist for AI like TensorFlow and CAFE, et cetera. Um, all of these are optimized to run really well on the Intel architecture. And in the bottom row here, you have the library developers that actually need direct access to the hardware. So we optimize quite a lot of the libraries like the Mac kernel library that provides uh, matrix computation that is very heavily used in the space of AI. So you can see that Intel is not just a processor company, but we have products across the board. Um, we have hardware products as well as software that sits on top of this hardware that gives you the entire portfolio that you would need to build AI solutions. 
So if you are a data scientist, what exactly does the AI journey look like? The first is to identify the challenge that you want to provide a solution to. That's the starting point, right? The second one is you may have a potential set of 10 solutions, not all of them may be feasible. So you will have to do some amount of assessment to figure out what is the most feasible approach. The third is you also have to ascertain certain values, like what is the level of security that's required? What are the ethical values? Uh, what are the social values? Things like those that will actually play a very critical role in the kind of solution that you will develop and deploy. The fourth step is you will need to put a team together to um, work on the AI project. The fifth is the choice of technology. What do you want to do the training on? How do you want to deploy it? Because this will have uh, impact on how you develop the solution itself. Because if you have picked a very complicated um, solution for the training piece, you also have to figure out if it is possible to take the solution and then deploy it on the field with the inference hardware. So putting this entire spectrum in one spot and assessing it end to end will actually make for um, a good assessment before you begin. The next three steps are data, creating a model and deploying. So we said in one of the earlier slides that data is the key to why AI is gaining so much momentum, right? So there are multiple steps here. You need to be able to obtain the data. You need to be able to clean up the data. You need to be able to figure out the right set of features to use for your project. Um, are they adequate? Are we over um, sampling the amount of data we have? Are we underrepresenting the data we have? And pre-process the data in some ways. In some cases, you may have very limited data available. So you will have to augment it in some way to make sure that you generate additional data that you can take it through the process. So things like that. The seventh is generating a model itself. Whether it is a machine learning model or a deep learning model, you have to create a model that will ultimately be able to make the prediction with the required accuracy. And the eighth step is to deploy it in the field. Now let's take a look at machine learning. So I would like to take your memory back to the, the Venn diagram that we saw in one of the very first slides. We talked about the brief introduction to what AI means in general. Now we are taking a look at the second circle, which is machine learning. So there are two ways of doing machine learning. The first is supervised learning, and the second is unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we have access to what is called ground truth. So let us take an example of Zillow. And let us say you're trying to make a prediction for the price of a house based on certain features. The features could be the number of bedrooms you want, the number of bathrooms you want, the number of garages you want, the zip code where you want the house to be, um, things like those, right? Each of those is a feature. And you already have pre-aggregated data that you are feeding through a model in the face of training to create um, the final outcome, right? That is what we call ground truth. The data is actually very clearly labeled according to the feature. And that is what we use in supervised learning. Some of the examples of supervised learning, this is a very um, simplistic classification problem where on the left you have spam detection. So depending on the email that comes into your inbox, you're trying to predict whether or not it is spam. Um, spam emails, if you actually notice, will have very clear um, features like the subject doesn't match the body of the email and there are certain words that shouldn't be there. So those are used as criteria to figure out which one is spam and which one is not. And the same thing applies um, to sentiment analysis where maybe if you go to a restaurant and you order food, um, did you like the food, did you not? Uh, did you like the movie, did you not? Things like those that you can again do with machine learning. But how do you actually figure out um, what the right answer is? So especially for classification type of problems, you will have to use accuracy as a metric. Uh, but in regression problems, which is similar to the housing example on Zillow that I just mentioned to you about, um, you use something called the mean squared error. What that means is if you look at this graph on the bottom right, 
you have multiple dots along the line that you see on the screen, right? Each of these vertical lines actually has two orange dots. So one of them is the actual value and one is the expected value. You are able to determine that because you have ground truth data available to you. Now, how do you determine what the most optimal line going through these points should be? Why should the slope of this line be this? Why can't the line actually go through this? The way you figure that out is by using something called mean squared error, where you are calculating the difference between the actual output and the expected output for each of these data points, and you're trying to minimize that difference. So that's why it's a minimum function here of the summation of all of the differences for actual value and expected value. And your goal is to minimize the amount of error. So the line that can go through all these points in such a way that the error is minimal is your most optimal solution. So these are again some metrics, um, but there are more complicated metrics um, that you can take a look at in some of the courses that I'll point you to at the end of the session. The next criteria is unsupervised learning. So in some cases, uh, the data that is given to the model does not know what the right answer is. And this is actually a very good way where you need to gather insights from the data. So for example, let us take a look at this slide. If you are an agency that is trying to market games, what is the segment of the demographic where you will need to focus your marketing budget on so you get the maximum amount of sales? So in this graph, you can actually see the clusters. You don't know how these clusters are formed until you really map them out on um, the graph using this unsupervised data. And if you actually look at the age groups here, you see that essentially there are three clusters. There are certain outliers, right? But there are three clusters one that applies to serious gamers, another as applying to casual gamers, and the third non-gamers. So if you want to focus the majority of your marketing uh, dollars here, it gives you an understanding of the approximate age group that you could be targeting. Again, this is a uh, very um, simple example. Additional um, machine learning examples. So for example, if you have used a credit card and there is a fraudulent transactions, uh, credit card companies can actually indicate to you that there's been some fraudulent behavior. Um, Netflix movie recommendation is also another example of machine learning. So for example, they use your past selections and selections of other people that have made similar options and then provide you with a recommendation about what you might like next. Uh, another example is news articles um, on any of the news channels. Their idea is to actually hold you on their website for as long as possible. So depending on the article that you're currently reading and certain keywords, it's called the bag of words model, certain keywords, you will actually make predictions on what other articles you may be interested in. So these are some of the examples for machine learning. But there are certain limitations to it. We saw one of those regression problems where we had a straight line that could go through all of the different data points, right? Now let's take a look at the XOR table that you have here. I have restricted the number of inputs to just two to convey the point. So here, if you look at the output, the output is a one when any of the inputs is a one. And if I map that out on a graph, you'll have two points on the graph where the output is one and two points on the graph where the output could be zero. So now there is no one line that can go through all of these different points, right? So this is, this is already getting more complicated than the examples that I talked about before. So if you were to really provide a solution for this XR problem, it could look something like this. How do you actually figure out that the output is one when the input is a combination of one and zero. You see here that this is your input level, this is your intermediate level, this is your output level. You only know what the inputs are, but you will need to adjust these weights, the ones that I have highlighted in green, and you'll also have to experiment with the values within these intermediate circles 
to figure out what will give you an output of one when either of the inputs is one. So if you use this math, I won't go into the details of it, and I'll make the slides available so you can compute it. If you go through this math, you will see that when both inputs are a zero, the output here will be zero. When both inputs are a one, the output will be zero, but for any of these two rows in between, the output will be one. So this particular arrow will only give you an answer of one when the inputs, the the product of the input and the weight you see on the arrow for all of the inputs to a specific circle, it exceeds a certain threshold. Only then will the output be one. So you again compute that for every arrow and that's how you figure that out. So this makes for a good bridge into what deep learning is all about. And that is where I'm going to spend a significant amount of my time showing you how you can build a neural network. So there are certain examples that you've probably seen on the news so um, or, or in different um, research articles and things like that. So if you look at the image on the left, this could be the global view that you're obtaining from a camera image, right? You want to be able to figure out how many different objects there are in your picture and what types of objects they are. So you're putting a bounding box essentially against those objects. So here we are listing the person as well as the motorbike. Another example is an autonomous driving. So let's take this example where you are on the street and you want to be able to ascertain with a significantly high accuracy whether a particular spot in your view is a pavement, is it the street, is it a person walking on the pavement or is it another driver or rider on the street? Is it a pedestrian crossing? Is it a signal? Is it a different color of a vehicle? So you see the magnanimity of the problem here, right? uh, how, how significant this problem is, right? In this case, you cannot actually look at the whole image. You'll actually have to look at every pixel within the image and be able to tell with significant accuracy whether that individual pixel belongs to a pavement or to the street. And that is what is called semantic segmentation. And that is um, another areas of um, deep learning. So we talked about Zillow and we used a regression problem to say how machine learning can be applicable there. But there is another category where you may want to buy a house based on the aesthetics of the house. Just based on how the house looks, you want to figure out what other options exist in the market. That becomes an image recognition problem. <coughs> so if you see here, based on the image in this picture, you will now train a model that will come up with recommendations for you. So that this is now an image recognition problem and it's not a regression problem anymore. So how exactly does deep learning achieve this? In the XOR problem, you actually saw that there was one input layer, <coughs> one intermediate layer, and one output layer. In each of those layers, a network is learning something. So let us say our data set has images of people, images of cars and images of different animals and miscellaneous objects, okay? Now your goal is when you show the network a picture of an elephant, the model should have learned enough features to be able to make a prediction that this is an elephant. So the way it does is it learns certain features within every single layer. It extracts certain features at the very first layer and it goes into the next level of granularity and learns more and more and more as you go through the layers and ultimately it's able to figure out what the final outcome is. That is exactly how deep learning works. Now with this context, let us see how you can build a deep neural network. Essentially, deep neural networks are inspired by biology. If you see the image on the top right, this is a biological neuron. 
each of these neurons actually receives signals from the neurons that it is connected to, processes it in some way, and triggers an output. The output could be either zero or one or, or different combinations. We'll talk about it in detail later. So if, if you were to create a computational neuron, this is kind of what it would look like. You could have multiple inputs designated by x1, x2, x3. Each of them have a certain weight, w1, w2, w3, because not all inputs may be important, right? You only want to cascade that output that has the higher weight. So you assign a weight to each of these inputs. And when the product x1, w1, plus x2, w2, plus x3, w3, exceeds the threshold B, the neuron fires. Now, if you recollect the XR model, I told you that each of those neurons in the middle, let me quickly go back to that slide. This one. Each of these now is a neuron, all right? Each of these has a weight. This is your X1, this is X2, this is W2, this is W1. Likewise, you have a weight on every single arrow. And there is also a threshold. These thresholds are found out experimentally, okay? So 1.5 and 0 0.5 are values that we actually had to experiment with to figure out how the neural network would fire. So that is essentially the concept here. Now, what is a fully connected neural network? In a fully connected neural network, you are using the same neurons. Each one of these circles is a neuron. You're stacking them up in a specific format. And every neuron in layer one is connected to every neuron in layer two. And layer two neurons are all connected to layer three neurons and so on and so forth. So there is extensive amount of research uh, that is going on in terms of how these neurons are actually stacked up. And if you were to um, read about artificial intelligence, either in the news or um, on different articles or in textbooks, you will hear the word topology. That topology actually refers to how these different neurons are stacked up in different layers. So now, what is an activation function? When you look at one biological neuron, depending on the number of inputs it has, the output of the neuron could essentially go from minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. In the interest of computation, it is good for us to put a boundary against these inputs. So an activation function is what puts this boundary. There are different types of activation functions again. The first one is a simple step function. The output is either a zero or a one. The more commonly used one is called a sigmoid function that crushes the um, input value between the range of zero and it has real values in between and it tapers at one. Third is hyperbolic tan function, which ranges from minus one to plus one. Again, it looks like an S similar to the sigmoid curve. And the fourth is a ReLU. So the input, when it is zero, your output is a zero, but when your input is in a range greater than zero, your output is also in between zero and one. So when you apply that activation, you apply it here. After you obtain the dot products, then you obtain the activation function and then create the output for each neuron. So what does that look like in terms of computation? Most of these computations are done as a matrix. So I'm just showing you one layer, but you would have to do this for every layer within your neural network. So X1, X2, X3 are your inputs. You have capital W of one, which designates all the weights in this first layer, and you obtain Z, which is a dot product, and you apply activation on Z to obtain values for this layer. And you do that similarly for every layer, and ultimately you obtain the final output. So your y hat is the output of that specific 
um, neuron once you have applied activations throughout the network. But there is a problem here. Why exactly is it Y1 hat, Y2 hat, Y3 hat? Um, this is just designative of the actual output of the network. So say you showed the network an image of an elephant, but the network has not really learned enough features in just one path to be able to accurately tell you that the output is an elephant. It could actually say it's a cat instead, right? That means that your network has not really learned enough to tell you with significant accuracy what the input is that you post to that network. So what can we do about it? How do you train a neural network? So far you've just gone through one pass of it. So what we do is there are two steps. In the forward propagation, you obtain the actual outputs, Y1 hat, Y2 hat, Y3 hat. Now you have to calculate what the, the loss function is between the expected outputs to the actual output. Now, again, just use the XR example as an analogy. Yeah, I told you that the 1.5 and the 0.5 within those intermediate neurons were actually experimental, right? In this neuron, you have to now go backwards from the last layer all the way to the first layer and readjust all the weights that you initially started with. When you're readjusting the weights, you're essentially telling every single neuron that it either has to correct itself in the positive direction or in the negative direction to be able to give you a better prediction the next time around. So this actually happens hundreds of thousands of times in larger neural networks before you can get a significant amount of accuracy for the model that you're trying to solve. So essentially to make a network learn, you calculate the loss function and then you do what is called back propagation, which creates a derivative for each weight and you cascade all the way through. You cannot stop at just one layer. Every single weight in between, every one of those arrows will have to readjust itself. That is how you create a basic neural network. But what is the problem with this fully connected neural network? So let's take an example of a small image, maybe 28 by 28 in size. So the number of input neurons that you will have for an image that is 28 by 28 is 28 multiplied by 28. And these are just the number of neurons in the very first input layer. To figure out the number of features that could exist in that small space, you will have to stack up multiple layers of neurons and this could just computationally add up. Just take a look at the size of images that cell phones can generate today. There are thousands of pixels by thousands of pixels. So your input neuron itself could have say 1024 by 1024 in the very first layer. So if you were to figure out features for that image, you will need a humongous amount of computation power. And you also need to remember all of these weights. So you need huge amounts of memory. You could very quickly run out of computational resources. So you have something called convolutional neural networks here. So what convolutional neural networks do is they take advantage of the spatial feature within an image. So for example, let's say we are trying to identify faces, right? Right now, my face is vertical and the features that a network could end up learning is say the distance between my eyebrows, the distance between my eyes and the T between my eyes and the nose and the lips and distance between the ears, um, just to name a few. But if I were to tilt my head 45 degrees, those same features would still apply and the network will still be able to predict that as a face as long as it's able to learn those things. So that is what I say when uh, I mentioned spatiality of images. So what they do is use something called feature maps or kernels and you pass them through the image to extract features. And at every layer, like I said earlier, the network learns something new. That is the concept of a convolutional neural network. And this reduces the amount of computation we need significantly if you were to compare the same problem on a fully connected neural network versus a computational neural network. 
So a brief example, this is an example of a computational neural network where you see that you have an input and you're recognizing digits here. So you have 10 outputs, each ranging from zero to nine. So depending on the input that you feed, so in this case, it is three. If the output is zero indexed, we expect the fourth neuron to fire because zero, one, two, three, fourth neuron to fire. But to get to that point, it requires to learn a significant amount of features. So what exactly does that feature look like? So if you see here, let us take a look at this particular feature. We are trying to determine the number of features that could exist in the digit three, right? This three has a vertical diagonal edge in this side, as well as, oops, sorry as well as in the lower um, quadrant. As you see here, there is one diagonal edge, another diagonal edge. So when you use this as a kernel and pass it through the image, the network is expected to learn that specific feature. And when you apply that feature to the input image, it says, yes, I have that feature or no, I do not have that feature. But now what happens if I were to pass an image eight instead of the image three? Even the image eight has the same diagonal edges. Has the network learned enough to tell with accuracy whether the input was an eight or a three? Maybe, maybe not. This is why you need to pass more data. You need to train the network as many times as is necessary to get a significantly high accuracy for the problem that you're trying to solve. So this is just a very basic example of what convolution looks like. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the um, challenges that actually exist. Availability of data in and off of itself is um, a fairly large problem. In many cases, you may have data that is readily available, maybe something that you use for a different problem. In some cases, you may have to consolidate data on your own. You may have to employ um, resources like the Amazon Mechanical Turk to consolidate data. You may have to glean from resources over the web, um, things like that before you have a consolidated data set that you can use for your problem. The, the shape of the data actually refers to the amount of um, features that you're using. Uh, you have to be very careful about not over engineering or um, using very few features that your network may not be able to really predict anything off of. So that is another thing that you'll need to learn. Uh, the amount of data, the more you have is always better, but in the case that you don't have enough, you may have to augment the data. So what I mean by saying augmenting the data is, in some cases, maybe you have, you just remove the red channel out of the color image. Maybe you remove the blue channel, maybe you remove the green channel, maybe you tilt it, right? Um, unless you provide a really good sample set for the model that you're trying to train, it is possible that your model will actually work perfectly for the training portion of, um, of your exercise. But when you deploy it, if you have not actually made sure that your data set had a good spectrum of representation, it may not fare really well when you deploy it in the field. So that is another thing you need to take a look at. And um, data pre-processing can actually come in really, really handy. So just to give you an example, a few years ago, our team was actually working on um, identifying cats and dogs. Those were the times when there were a lot of wildfires and a lot of uh, pet owners had to release their pets. So if I found a pet that was um, wandering in the fire and smoke for a long time, um, is there a way for me to connect the owner with that pet? The initial assessment that we made was we we had perfectly clean images of cats and dogs that we obtained from different open source um, sources and few that we added uh, through our own repository and stuff like that but they were all perfect clean images and then when we actually deployed it the model was faring really really poorly we didn't know why after a while of experimenting, we figured out that that was because when you actually take a camera image of maybe a pet that has been in uh, fire and smoke and dirt for a long time, it's not going to be the same clean image without any noise. 
So you have to feed such data into your training model as well and make sure that your model has learned enough from all of those different types of data sources to be able to ultimately predict when you deploy your application. So that is one thing to really, really uh, keep in mind. Another problem is labeling the data itself. We talked about ground truth, right? But somebody has to label them. And sometimes it is subject matter experts. Sometimes it may not be subject matter experts. We are telling them that this is what we want and they label it. And there is always a scope for human error. So ideally what we do when we train a model is if you have hypothetically, let us say you have 100,000 data points, 100,000 images and you're solving an image classification problem. We split this data set into say 70% and 30%. The 30% we do not use at all. We just save it as though they are real time images and we only use them once the complete model is trained. We use the first 70% to train the model. So now if there is a labeling error in that 70% that you are using, it is necessary, it's important for you to minimize the error in your final outcome that could arise from having faulty labeled data. So what you could do is you took the first split of let's say 75% and 25%, you shuffle the data around, and then you take the next set of 75% and the first 25%, keep the first 25 aside, use the latter 75%. You're essentially shuffling the data about which ones you're using for training and which ones you're using for validation. That's a process called cross-validation that is heavily used. Um, possibilities for overfitting and underfitting. What this actually means is if you have perfect data that you have used to train your model, it may actually work perfectly. It may even give you 98, 99% accuracy for those exact images but when you deploy it in the field, it may not work, similar to the cat and dog example that I talked about. Um, and human bias, this is again another important problem that we will have to keep in mind when you are um, labeling the data set, pre-processing the data set, and also training the data set, because it is very important to minimize the human bias that could go into algorithms. Because at the end of the day, these are computational systems, and any bias that we introduce in them will be shown in the output as well. So at this point, um, we talked about the hardware capabilities that Intel offers, how you can take advantage of it, the software capabilities, and the third pillar is the community support. But before I show you what kind of community support exists, I want to briefly talk about some of the skill sets that you might need. Um, before you start looking at what kind of disciplines you may want to major in, um, what kind of skill sets are really necessary if you want to do anything in AI. So this is again a very simplistic diagram. Um, math and statistics are extremely important. For me, when I actually started as an AI evangelist, um, I had I had probably not used statistics on the job for a really, really long time. I had to go back to all of the statistics that I learned in high school and back in college and brush up on it because all of the um, neural networks and even the way the computations are done and understanding different machine learning techniques, it really helps if you can have a math and statistics um, understanding. Uh, different concepts in machine learning and deep learning, I'll give you resources for those. In terms of programming, I think Python is one thing that will come in really, really handy, um, mainly because there are a lot of machine learning and deep learning libraries that provide a significant amount of support that you can use to develop your machine learning and deep learning model. But in terms of just the technical skills, those are some of them. But you also need to learn to love data because you will not probably be able to see at first glance um, what the data is trying to tell you. And sometimes it can be frustrating if you, if, you, if you don't have that love for data, you just have to keep trying over and over again. And ultimately when you chart it all out, it makes perfect sense, but it's, it's natural in some ways, it's acquired in some ways, but, um, you need to have that love for data. 
a mindset to actually visualize the data because it's all at the end of the day you may have a very very compelling solution but you also have to be able to tell a story you have to convince your management that it's a feasible solution and it is possible to deploy it without being able to visualize what the model is actually doing and how it can actually come together as a perfect solution and without being able to tell that story you may not be able to win stakeholders over so um programming um python i would say um, c c++ a little bit but um uh, soft skills are equally critical to some of these technical skills and i can tell you with my own personal experience that i i'm not a data scientist i don't have a degree in data science but i learned all of these things on the job and initially it may look a little intimidating but if you actually persist there are resources that you can actually use and you can come up to speed really very quickly now let's take a look at some of the resources that you can take advantage of from intel so we have the intel developer zone called idz um, the url is here and for anything any resource in ai you can go to this url you have a lot of articles a lot of code samples proof of concepts that actually walk you through the whole process of how you can uh, build machine learning models, deep learning models, how to actually deploy, what kind of software can you use from that software um, portfolio that I actually showed you about, and how to share it with other students, and um, how to learn from the community. So here are some URLs. Um, I, would, I would recommend that you take a look at all of these courses we have a fully self-paced course for machine learning deep learning tensorflow um, introduction to ai natural language processing um, time series analysis anomaly detection computer vision you name it so robotics there are a lot of these um, self-paced learning kits that are available on the student kit page and you can download them they have code samples as well as lecture material and um, i hope you can get a good starting point from this presentation um, we've kept this presentation as simple as possible to help you understand some of the uh, very basic principles of how you can build a machine learning and deep learning model so i hope you found it useful that's all I had for today. And I think at this point, we can take some of the questions that have come in. Awesome, Miss Rao. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. I learned so much. I didn't even know what much about AI before I came. So I'm glad I, I listened in. Um, <laughs> and we do so have much. some questions. Glad. So I want to get to them. Yeah, yeah well, definitely. So I'm going to just start from the First one we came in, and then I'll just read from there. So the first question we have is, how was Intel avoiding human bias? Well, um, so human human bias can exist at various levels within the different types of problems, right? So we the first step is to actually be aware of them and make sure that we actually take those through the different um, product developments through Intel. So we make that a part of our process. So uh, that's, that's kind of how we actually try to make sure that we minimize the amount of bias that exists in AI systems or any, any product for that matter. Cool. What kind of software can be used for cluster analysis and PCA? Or maybe it was PCS. Okay, so uh, for machine learning, I would actually recommend that you take a look at the scikit-learn um, library. There are quite a lot of um, algorithms that you can um, take advantage of. And one of the student kits that are actually mentioned here will take you through some of the statistical methodologies for, um, for all of these types of machine learning. So I didn't talk about k-nearest neighbors. I didn't talk about support vector machines. I didn't talk about quite a lot of the machine learning techniques that are more complicated that actually exist out there that can solve more complex problems. But um, 
some of the toolkits, um, the, the math kernel library, the Intel parallel Python, they are all optimized to actually work really well with um, machine learning as well. And if you download the Intel parallel version of Python, all of these Python libraries, like I talked about, NumPy, SumPy, and um, uh, scikit-learn, they're all optimized already for you guys to download and use. So as developers, most of you people will probably uh, be using Anaconda. And if you want to um, download the Intel, Intel version of Python, I would actually recommend that you go to the Intel channel and grab the libraries from there. So you get the entire repository that will give you all these libraries that you can use for all of these different types of machine learning algorithms. Cool. Um, this next question, I love this question. This question comes from Amari. Um, she uh, or they ask, what can undergrad computer scientists do to get ready for a career in AI slash machine learning? OK. That's a really good question. So if you are new to the field of AI, my first recommendation for you is please do not get intimidated. Um, there are specific things that you would need to learn. Like I mentioned, having an understanding of statistics definitely helps. And AI in general is a very collaborative um, discipline. So whether you are in computer science, whether you are in electrical engineering, whether you are in mechanical engineering, um, whether you are even a business student, um, or e <coughs> even physics and biology, um, you can bring all of these different skill sets and solve different types of AI problems. But all in all, I think as a very good starting point, what you would like to have is an under, a good foundation in statistics and mathematics. Try to learn Python because it is really helpful for you to code for the whether it is machine learning or deep learning. Um, take a look at some of these courses. Start with the introduction to AI course and then go into machine learning, deep learning and TensorFlow in that order. That will give you the foundations of what can be done using machine learning with Python, what can be done with deep learning using Python, and how to use TensorFlow as a framework. And then, irrespective of which discipline you want to kind of navigate to, whether it could be natural language processing or you may want to do robotics, you may want to do more computer vision, you will be able to go off on a tangent at that point. But having the basics in terms of pillars, in terms of machine learning, deep learning, TensorFlow, and Python, and some statistics, that's a good starting point. Um, and follow up with that, there's another question related similar to that is, what classes do you have to take in high school? If you have any coding um, opportunities, definitely try to learn Python. Um, there are also quite a lot of um, uh, coding um, exercises like code.org that you can explore, right, to understand some of these coding principles. Even they have some amount of robotics and stuff like that as well. So um, in high school, try to get a good foundation of coding and mathematics. Uh, if you have an opportunity to do any um, projects with artificial intelligence, let me let me actually take a step back here and try to emphasize one point. There is a lot of work that has already been done by others in the field of AI, right? Um, building a network might actually, it might stop. Okay, give me just a second. Um, so, it might actually feel intimidating if you wanted to build an entire network from scratch, but it is actually possible for you to even build simple neural networks, even if you are at a high school level. What you can do is take a look at what has been actually already done. If you are trying to do um, image classification problem, right? You are, let us say um, you want to solve a healthcare problem, um, just using one example. 
uh, see if there are any open source data sets out there and see if there are any examples of projects that are already done. And in today, actually a lot of people share the projects that they have done through GitHub and uh, different channels like that. Take a look at that. And a good starting point, if you really wanted to explore, would be to take something that somebody has already created and see if you can actually extend on it, change that in some way and build a different problem or build a different solution or a more optimal solution to an existing problem. All of these things are possible, but the general thing is just the curiosity about what is going on in today's world, trying to understand um, uh, what kind of problems that are being solved. So I showed that one slide with different industries and what kind of problems are being um, tackled in each of those industries. Take a look at that. Uh, build a general curiosity and that will automatically take you along um, to the research that is happening in the industry, the research that is happening in academia, um, to the kind of products that people are actually building using open source projects. Um, there are a lot of articles again on IDZ, but there are also a lot of articles on other channels like Medium, Stack Overflow, etc. Try to take a look at that and um, hopefully that will help build your curiosity to do more in the space of AI. Megan, uh, yes. are there modules available for interface with Microsoft Visual Studio, IDE machine learning? So we do have um, one, it's called the AI on the PC course, and that is again listed on the student kit. And that will actually guide you through how you can do some of the machine learning using um, uh, VinML and how, how you can take advantage of the Intel hardware. So you definitely do. It's all listed in the student kits. Cool, and then one more last one. Does Intel have any blockchain technology projects that deal with machine learning or AI? Also, would blockchain be a useful skill for an undergraduate student? Well, that would uh, definitely be an interesting um, project or course that you would like to want to explore in your undergraduate curriculum. But to be really honest, I don't know if there is a project that is currently underway at Intel, but I can definitely take a look at it and get back to you on that. There are different groups. In, I mean, Intel is a very large company, right? We have uh, teams around the world. So it is possible that one of the groups are trying to address problems in that area. I, I don't know. I'm not aware of it today, but I'll definitely check. Okay. And then, did you get that last part? Would blockchain be a useful skill for an undergraduate student? It definitely would be. I mean, um, it also depends on the personal interests as well, right? Um, but I would definitely think so. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. And I read about a lot um, on blockchain. So definitely, yeah. Don't restrict yourself. I would keep reading about everything because it is possible that um, you, you might start from one field and you might extend on it or you might actually find something that is similar to it um, that you will also find um, very useful and interesting. So pursue your interests, definitely. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you so much for those, answering those questions. There were some very good questions, everyone. Um, and you. I appreciate your taking the time to sit with us for today. Um, I think, I mean, I wish we could like everybody give every, um, Ms. Rao a hand clap, but I know that's, we can't oh, see you anybody, so but I'll clap for you. I'm, I'm very thankful for this opportunity and uh, I don't think I put my email on the slide deck, but I will share this slide deck with everybody that attended today and I'll put my email on it. So if you should have any questions, please reach out to me and I will try to answer them as best as I can. If I cannot, I will try to find an answer for you. Awesome, thank you. And so that reminds me, um, in closing, I just wanna tell everyone that everyone who has registered today, they'll receive an email and in the email, they'll have a link to our survey um, about this webinar presentation. Um, also, like Ms. Rao had said, she'll have her email and the slides, we will have that. Also, 
um, we were we recorded this session today, so we will um, be having this on our website as well, our ACES website, and we'll have the link for that as well. Um, I also have some few announcements to make. Our next webinar with Intel um, will be on April 22nd. Um, so I hope so that's about a month away. I hope you all can join. It's going to be the same similar format. Um, we will have a great speaker. His name is Mr. Tom Lassiter. I'm excited to hear from him. Um, and the topic is going to be on AI for business. So some of you business people, uh, majors, um, I hope you can come next month for that second webinar. Um, and again, we'll be sharing that link and also advertising um, on our social media, eblast, um, and all the other um, outreach areas that we do. Um, also, too, I want to say thank you again to um, Miss Rhonda from Intel, um, who put this helped put this all together. Um, Ruben, who was our our T. Um, person at ASUS, and of course, Ms. Rao, she did awesome. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, yeah, so I am glad to see everyone. I hope everyone stays safe. Um, and keep a reminder that our scholarships, the deadline has been extended for our Intel scholarships. They extend till May 15th. The priority deadline is March 31st, so that's next week. But our extended uh, deadline has been extended to May 15th of 2020. So for students out there, get your applications in, get them, try to get them in by that party deadline. Um, we also have internships on our website as well. So good luck to our students, hang in there. Um, thank you to all our professionals. And again, thank you to our speakers and everyone that helped support today. Um, I'll see you guys next month, April 22nd. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye.